Just Imagine, a podcast series by Imagine Theatre. Hello again, I hope you're well. My name is Martin Ballard and I'm delighted that you can join me again for episode 12 of this podcast series from one of the UK's biggest producer of pantomime and children's theatre. For more information, go to their website at www.imaginetheatre.co.uk. As we continue the countdown to Panto 2021, we've taken you behind the scenes at Imagine Theatre in all of the previous episodes, meeting the directors, the choreographers, the lighting designers and some of the stars of Imagine Theatre shows. Now, don't worry if you missed any of the previous episodes because they're still available. In episode 11, if you missed it, I spoke to the actor, musician, director, singer and musical director Stephen Wren. Now, this time, I'm delighted to have been joined by the Scottish television and theatre actress, star of a number of sitcoms and children's television programmes from Rabsy, Nesbitt and Still Game, to Me Too, Jane McCarry. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Martin. Very well, thanks. Well, first of all, it's lovely to speak to you, and I've mentioned some of the amazing things you've done on television. We'll get to your theatre work later on as well. One of a number of Scottish performers we've spoken to on the podcast series already, but I'm intrigued as to how it all began for you. Uh, When were you first influenced by theatre and became aware of performing? The very first time I remember, I was probably, I was about eight or nine, and I was playing Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio so that was in the school show and accidentally the boy who was playing Pinocchio Clark Crosby with his <laughs> with his Pinocchio nose I accidentally knocked it off with my finger when I was singing the song and I remember I got, and it's weird that you remember I remember getting a huge laugh and the feeling that I got when I got that laugh and then poor Clark Crosby ran off crying but I was too selfish to care about that and then <laughs> And I remember the excitement in my stomach. And I was never particularly academic at school. I was always kind of somewhere in the middle, plodding along. And I thought, oh, I think I'd quite like to do this. And then as time went on, I couldn't think of anything else that I wanted to do. So I applied for drama school. And then and that's, that's kind of how I got into the business. But I do remember that feeling that day. And, and getting that laugh so it was never in other shows where you were doing serious things or songs or it was never the applause it was the laughter that kind of hooked me and, and what about going to see shows do you remember going to see shows as a child and did you go to see panto as a child I did always go and see Panto and the, the tradition of Panto in Scotland, I'm sure in England as well, it's just I, I don't have any experience of that, but up here it was absolutely fantastic and I used to go to the King's Theatre in Glasgow and you had people doing pantomime like Ricky Fulton, you had uh, Jack Mulroy, you had Jared Kelly, you had, you know, all these people, then later on folk like Elaine C. Smith and, you know, it really was, it was a fabulous thing to go and see and Up here, we tend not to have celebrities in pantos. We tend to have actors, performers. So you, it's a different feel. You know, it's like a proper, it's like a proper West End show in a way. It's it's not somebody who's maybe been in a reality TV show. Nobody's coming to see somebody because they were on the telly. People are coming to see a show that um that that they just love. So I loved going to see them when I was younger and I I think my favourite bit probably was when they would throw the sweeties out, Mm -hmm. which they don't do that now. I think that's terrible. Health and safety gone mad. Throw sweeties. Well, that's interesting because Stephen Wren, who we spoke to on the last episode, who I know you've worked with before, still throws sweets out into the audience, but they think about which sweets are safe these days. They choose them very carefully. What about the other traditions as a child then? Did you ever, for instance, go up as a child for the song sheet? No, because we would have been at the very back in the gods. (laughs) In the cheapest possible seats. So there was no chance that I would ever get to do that. No, never. Um, and then after you trained, uh, was it straight into theatre? Because I know you've taught as well, haven't you? Yeah, well, I, I went to drama school straight from school. And then when I was 30, I went back to do a, a diploma in teaching because, well, just because I wanted to have kids, actually. And I'd been touring about doing theatre for so many years that I just thought there's no way I could do this with kids. It, it would be impossible. So I thought, what am I going to do to earn money? So that's why I went back to do teaching, which I do love. And it's been an absolute godsend over lockdown because um, I, I've been teaching in a school in Greenock. So I'll be doing wee Zoom jobs, wee, wee bits and bobs, readings for things. And, you know, that, that's that been great. 
but fundamentally without teaching I wouldn't have been able to survive so I'm very glad I did. Let's talk about your theatre work then because you've appeared in just about every venue across Scotland including the Edinburgh Festival Theatre amongst others with various different theatre companies performing a real variety of material. It's, it, is, it has been varied. We did 51 shows at the Hydro so the Hydro's that was like 11,000 people per show so that was absolutely massive and it felt like you were in a rock concert because you know when they would play the theme tune to still give it's like da, 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 and you could feel it through every part of your body that was i mean although you couldn't really call yourself a rock star when you were dressed as a pensioner <laughs> it's like a world away like the opposite and even our parties afterwards i'd have a cup of tea it was so, so boring but um probably nobody in the hydro has a cup of tea after a gig or maybe they do who knows maybe that's the secret life uh, of madonna maybe she just has a wee cup of tea but no no that was like so exciting and such a buzz but just now I'm doing a Pitlochry Festival theatre and everything's outside. So we're doing a show out on the grass, right at, right at the river, in front of the theatre. And so there's maybe 80, 100 people that are there. So it's a big different, that's very different to say something like the Hydro or even the Kings. But that's just as exciting. In fact, in some ways, it's more exciting because you can see everybody's face. So when you're coming through the audience, although everybody's spaced out and it's all very safe, all the wee kids that have not been to see a show maybe in their lives because they're two or three or maybe it's the first time for a long time, they are so excited and they're like squealing with excitement. They're clapping their hands, they're waving at you. They're so engaged. That is magical and so, so special. I guess it is for you too, because like many people in the business, your work has been greatly affected by COVID-19. In fact, this is probably the first show you've done since lockdown, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah it is. And I think they've been really brave, um, all, all the people at Pitlochry, to say, right, let's try and do this, because the National Theatre of Scotland, they were putting on a, a show as well, and they were doing a Shakespeare outside and then two of the cast members got COVID. So they, they've had to pull most of the show. I think they were only doing six at the end. So it is very brave, but so far, touch wood, we've not have to, had to cancel any shows. And it seems to be, be going down really well with people because they're up on their holidays. Folk aren't going abroad. So Putlockery is always a busy place for tourists, but just now it's absolutely jam-packed. So it's great for people who are on holiday to see, oh, what could we do? Oh, there's Wind in the Willows. Let's go and see a show. Loads of shows that they're doing, not just Wind in the Willows. I'm doing other ones as well, but everybody's, you know, it's like a proper rep. So there's tons that people could go and see no matter what you like. I'm just putting a wee plug out there for Put Lockin because I think <laughs> I really do. Hats off to them for, for, for doing this. So Jane, how tough has it been for you? I know some performers and actors have been able to do some online work, some stream performances and so on. What have you been able to do? I think it's been tough for everybody, but uh, as I say, I have been teaching, I have been doing Zoom jobs because Mark Cox, who's also in the panto in Greenock that we do we do together with Imagine, and we were in Still Game, we were at drama school together, we've known each other forever. So we've been doing different, we do after dinner speaking and burn suppers and things in the real life as well. So yeah, lots of Zoom jobs to oil rigs and strange things, you know. Uh, yeah, it's been weird. And uh, but also teaching and also um, I've done a couple of wee short films, things like that. Now, you mentioned Still Game, one of the many things you're known for on television. But where did that first TV break come from? Was that with Rabsi Nesbitt? No, it was actually the, who I was talking about, um, Ricky Fulton, who was I mean, we just loved Ricky Fulton up here. He was a genius and he used to do a show called Scotch and Rye. And that was on every hug money. So we call, New, you know, New Year's Eve hug money. Uh, so everybody watched it and it, I was so, I mean, honestly, all through growing up, that was all you looked forward to at Hugmanay before the Bells, Scotch and Rye. And then he did a spin-off of that called Tis a Season to be Jolly. And that was one of the very first telly shows that I did. And it was Jimmy Logan, who was so well known up here in Ricky Fulton, and, and me as a, a dental nurse. And that was my first toe in the water with the comedy unit. I had I'd gone to a general audition and I was just beside myself to be in something like that and my mum and dad were just oh they couldn't believe it so and actually what happened was it was a dentist um, 
Jimmy Logan was a dentist, I was a dental nurse, Ricky Fulton was in the chair, but we filmed it in a real dentist surgery and it said in the script, dental nurse puts mask over Ricky Fulton's face and turns on the gas. So I did that because that's what it said in the script. But of course it was real gas. And then there was a whole big hoo-ha and it was quite late when we were filming because the dentist surgery obviously had to be closed. He was sick and the whole went to stop filming and he'd go for a rest because he was an older man. And, and they were saying, why did you do that? I said, because it said to do it. Nobody said it was going to be switched on and it was real. So I remember coming home and greeting and thinking, that's it. I'll never work there again. But they did forgive me. And so, yeah, I did lots of different jobs. And then we did a thing called Pulp Video. And it was a sketch show and that's where I met Ford and Greg and Gavin Mitchell and, you know, a lot of the cast that are in Still Game. And then they went on to do Tune the Fat and I did the radio shows for Tune the Fat. But then I had a baby and then I went to train as a teacher and we kind of all went on to do our own things. And then after Tune the Fat, they wrote Still Game and they wrote Isa for me. So I'm very grateful that they did because I loved playing Isa for 20 years, I think I've played Isa. So it was, it was a wonderful experience and we were all you know, close and it was like a sort of big family and it was it was just wonderful. In fact, its popularity never waned and you mentioned the shows at the Hydro in Glasgow. They were so popular, the BBC recommissioned the series, didn't they? And it returned, I think, five or six years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right, because we all thought that was it, that, you know, we would never do it again. And then, you know, it was so scary because we didn't know whether a show like that would work in a venue that size. You know, we thought this could be a disaster. But it, it was just, I mean, it was, oh, it was magical. Like just going out into that audience and people were so welcoming and people had all dressed up as the characters and <laughs> it was like the Rocky Horror Show or something. But it, no, it was just wonderful. It, it really was. So then by the end of Still Game, they came back and they did another three series and then we all died at the end. Mm -hmm. And it was really sad, actually, because we kind of faded away as old people tend to do you know there was no big drama it was just one day you're there and then you know you go what happened to mrs so-and-so oh i don't know did she go into home or oh i don't know i think she maybe died in the house nobody really knows you just disappear you know and then somebody else moves into your house and, and time marches on so i think the way that the boys ended the show it was it was lovely actually but it was quite emotional and it was emotional to say goodbye to all those characters and all the times that all of us have spent together. And I, and I still love the boys dearly. I'm, some more than others just because of life and circumstances, but some of them certainly I, I see a lot and I'm, I'm really close to. Just going back to the dental nurse who, who gassed Ricky Fulton, didn't you play a nurse in Rabsi Nesbitt as well? I think you played a couple of characters. Ah, I played a few episodes. characters, yeah, yeah, a few different characters in Rabsi, yeah, over the years. And the great thing for any families who come to see you in Panto is that they can all relate to you from the various things you've done on television, not least the children, many of whom have grown up with Granny Murray and Me Too, which had incredible success. I think that started around 2005, 2006, didn't it? Yeah, because Alexander, he's my youngest and he was, oh, so he was born in 2004. So yeah, he was about one. So I used to feel so guilty playing a childminder and then like not actually having my own child. You know, you'd feel so guilty because I had mum and dad watched him and I had a wonderful childminder dot who's no longer with us either. And, you know, she was just wonderful and mum and dad were too. But uh, yeah, I did feel quite guilty. But uh, certainly it was it, it was really good. It was great fun. And Helen Doherty, who made that show, um, she was in Mark's year, the year below me at drama school as well. So we'd all known each other for years. And there was always a great wisdom that came from Granny Murray, almost a moral with every story. In many ways, rather strangely, uh, like the wisdom of Mrs Doubtfire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. But sometimes it was completely random. In fact, some people have put together stuff on YouTube where it's a mix of all their sayings. <laughs> it is just, it's mental. It's absolutely mental. But yes, it was really good fun. And things would happen, like sometimes the kids would, would argue or fight or somebody would be naughty. And, but they, they always had a parent or somebody with them, a chaperone with them. And there was there was a screen where the, you know, the chaperone and the parent could see the kids at all times. So if they were naughty, it wasn't my place to give them into trouble. It was the chaperone or the mum's place, you know. So I didn't want to say anything. And the kids would look at me like, Granny Murray, he's being naughty. Why aren't you doing anything? And you feel really rubbish you know but I'm like well I can't really because he's mum standing behind me behind that mirror 
but no, most of the kids were, were brilliant, really lovely. And there was a wee boy, Kai, and he always had to stay over, but it was obviously filmed during the day. So he always had to go to bed and he would see all the other kids going to the park, going for adventures with Granny Murray. And he used to say to me, please, Granny Murray, please don't put me to bed. Please, can we go to the park? I'm like, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You have to go to bed. You have got to get another boring story from Granny Murray while everybody else is going to watch fireworks and things. From everything you've said, it's clear that you were made for Panto right from that school show in Pinocchio through to children's television and the other comedy you've done on TV. It was obvious you were going to do Panto, but when was the first one for you? Oh, that's hard. Um... Oh, I remember now, actually. Yes, my first was at Cumbernauld Theatre, which is great because there's there was a, something called a VOM, which I've never, ever been in a theatre that's had that. So you could you could enter. It was almost like in the round, but you would enter from underneath. So that was fabulous. You could come like up from underneath or round from any side or through the audience. And I remember I was an evil magpie. Um, so you could kind of swoop down on people and give them a fray. And that was great fun. So I left drama school in 92, so that was, and I got a job with the Tron Theatre, we went to Canada with that in Montreal, which was really exciting, and then when I came home we started in Cumbernauld, so that was my first one, so I think I've done something like 26 pantos, I didn't do a panto of the year, I had one, my, my older boy in December, my younger boy in November, and it was another year that I was filming that I couldn't, but I think maybe that's only three years that I've not done it. And other than that, I've always been somewhere. So I have absolutely loved it. And we've we've had so many laughs. And, and I think because you're doing two or used to be three shows a day, you become like a family because there's no time to go home. There's no time to have a life outside of that show. So I genuinely have loved it. And of course, you've built up a fabulous rapport with the audience as well because the families keep coming back. They return each and every year and it's part of their Christmas, isn't it? I think it's the only theatre job where you look out and you would see children from babies in arms and then toddlers, kids. Then you've got, you know, mums or dads or aunties, uncles, grannies and grandpas it's every single and a whole family would come together and it's such a celebration they would dress up they'll put on their christmas jumpers and i think it's lovely when you see granny or papa and then you know a wee baby next to them and and it's the only kind of job really you would break the fourth wall unless you're in variety which i don't do, do variety shows usually but you know it's, it's the only where you can kid people on you can bring people out up onto the stage you can really have a rapport with the audience and I think it's that's what just makes it so special do you remember what what, what it was like when your own kids first came to see you in panto I don't know how old they would have been and what their reaction was well I should just bring them really from the were babies and they would be you know in the wings or the dressing room or they were just so used to being part of that and getting papped about from one person to the next and they would watch them and somebody else would watch them and even when I was filming, I used to just bring the kids on set and they would sit in the winnie with my pal or my mum or somebody else who was in the cast. i say, well, you're not in that scene. <laughs> Do you want a baby? And has that had an influence on their career plans? My older boy, he's actually at college doing stage management. He wants to do props and things behind the scenes. And the younger one, he used to want to be an actor, but he doesn't now. But, uh, he, you know, he kind of likes that side of it. So I think that it's kind of in their bones that they're just used to being there all the time and they would just puddle about and be on stage. Well, every family who has a member in Panto over Christmas knows that it is a major part of the Christmas tradition for them. Last year for me was the first year in the last 30 years that I haven't done a Panto. My son's 25. He's never known me be at home <laughs> around Christmas time. It was really strange last year, wasn't it? It was because um, my oldest boy was born the 29th of December. So it's been rotten for him because every single birthday, including his 18th, he's come to the panto. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm selfish and I wanted to see him on his birthday. He always goes out afterwards or goes somewhere the next year or the day before, but he always likes to come. And I did say to him in his 18th, you know, you, you really don't need to. And he went, no, mum, I'll go out the next night. I'll come, we'll all go for tea. And a big gang of them came down for tea. But... Last year was the first year that I've been off. So we decided to book a few days away and then all the regulations changed. So it was going to be something special because I was off. And then remember they said it was only like a couple of days just before Christmas, but there's no way we could have travelled. And that was it. I know. So frustrating, wasn't it? Okay, three questions to finish with, Jane. 
I've been asking all of the guests on the podcast series the same three questions. And the first is this. What is your favourite panto title? It's really tricky to answer that because I've done so many versions of the kind of top five that it would be difficult to say because there's all different, there's ones that I love in all different ways. I think it would probably have to be Aladdin, just because the music, I usually like the music. I think as well, you have to bear in mind all the panto ingredients need to be there. There has to be an adventure, which there is in Aladdin. There has to be a transformation scene. There has to be a good daemon. There's none better than Widow Twanky. But I wonder if you were watching a panto, would it be any different, Jane? Would you choose a different title if you were watching from the audience as your favourite? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think um, I think the standard is usually so high, you know, and even the ones that you don't think that you enjoy when you actually go and see it, then you do. You know, like Mother Goose, I would never kind of go, oh, Mother Goose, that would be the one that I would pick. But actually, when I've done Mother Goose, I've really enjoyed it, and the script's been really funny. So I like a baddie to be bad. Mm. I, I genuinely do. I think I prefer it when it's written that you have one character who... You know, it can be funny at the end because it all goes wrong for them and that's fine. And it's great till you can laugh at the baddie, but I don't think the baddie should try to be funny. Mm -hmm. I think that's somebody else's job. It's the same with the sort of principal boy, principal girl. I quite like them to be straight. Yeah. I quite like everybody to have a different role and for that to be very different. Uh, because everybody, you know, a lot of the wee kids, they just adore buttons and that's their favourite. But they want to hate somebody. They want to boo, they want to. They want the baddie to be really wicked and to have a sense of fear. I think that's why one of my favourite baddies was that evil magpie, that very first one, because it was Hansel and Gretel and there was real danger for the kids in Hansel and Gretel and the witch, but the witch was funny. So I think that I, I felt like the magpie really genuinely had to be evil and they had to be really scared and I did love that. I have to say that in all the uh, podcasts that I've done and people that I've spoken to over the years, I think you're the only other person I've met who's done Hansel and Gretel. I did it many, many years ago. And it's interesting because so many panto titles have been lost over the years. Now it's very much driven by Disney, isn't it? And the Disney movies that kids can relate to, like Aladdin, Cinderella and so on. But um, it's a shame we've lost some of those others, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think Hansel and Gretel actually was one of my favourite ones because it genuinely was really, really scary. And although it was a panto, it was it was also sort of like, it crossed the line between Christmas show and panto. And I think that's different as well. Some places up here, like the Citizen Theatre, it's a Christmas show. And, you know, that's good in a different way. But it's very different to a pantomime. And I think Hansel and Gretel is probably the only one that I've ever been to that can that can cross and be both. Yeah, and again, it's got all the elements, hasn't it? You know, the baddie, it's got the adventure, uh, the leading characters are, are children as well, which is slightly different. But I love it. I wish it was done more often. Now, what about... <laughs> you'll like this one. What about... When it wasn't all right on the night, Jane, when did things go wrong? And hopefully you were able to laugh about it. Oh, so many times things have gone wrong because, you, you know, for you, you do so many. Um, I remember quite often as well, I've asked if I can take my wee dog on and people love that. So that's like not when it's gone wrong, but it's like, like once, can I take on Mac? And people go, oh, uh, so I'll, I've loved doing that. But I remember the last time we did Panto and there was a scene, it was like front of cloth and I was the baddie and it was the same kind of, <laughs> it was the same, a very similar scene, two or three in the, the first act and two or three in the second. So I came on and Mark was kludgy and I, I'm supposed to do a whole big rant to kludgy and kludgy doesn't come on. So I'm thinking, oh no, where is he? What's happened? He's forgotten. So I'm making stuff up, making stuff up, just talking absolute rubbish and ages is going on. And I'm saying, Cladgy, Cladgy, where are you, Cladgy? And I'm thinking, oh no, how are we going to get out of this? What are we going to do? And then poor Mark came on with his trousers and fastened it fasten his trousers and I said Cludgy and of course Cludgy in Scotland is a toilet I said Cludgy where were you and he said oh mistress I was in the Cludgy and I said well you should have been here and he said no mistress I'm not on again until the second act <laughs> and I went ah I'm in the wrong scene he went yes mistress you're in the wrong scene I'm like oh so that was delicious and then later on 
I think it was that same show, I was doing a dance with Jimmy Chisholm, who's a wonderful dame, and he's in our panto of the year, and he's just a fantastic, such a well-known actor in Scotland. And I was dancing away to an ABBA, giving it my, my all, and the audience all started laughing and whooping. And I looked down and my whole, because it was just, it was a quick change, so it was Velcroed on, my whole top had fallen down. So I was dancing in my bra. Dancing, <laughs> singing, giving it laldy in my bra. And I just thought, oh no. But do you know what? It was funny. And then they, they just made jokes to the end of the show about it. And, you know, it was like, ah, oh, well, <laughs> I'm glad I had a clean bra. I thought it was one of my better bras. That's all I can say. One thing's for sure. The audience absolutely love it when things go wrong, as long as they're included. You've just got to keep it going, haven't you? You've got to be on your toes. That's right. I know. It, and it really doesn't matter. I think people, as long as... I've never really liked a fake corpse and a lot of people do that when they, mm. you know, and they, they pretend and I know the audience, they go, oh, remember that night? And, and they all started laughing. But uh, And I know people love it, but it kind of makes me cringe. But I do love when something genuinely goes wrong where the audience can see, like your top falls down <laughs> and, uh, and everybody's laughing together and it's joyful, the connection. It's joyful. You'll never, there, there, there's nothing to beat that in this world, that feeling of everybody really genuinely, all of us laughing together. Well, it's clear you love Panto. So the final question has to be, why is Panto so special to you, Jane? It's special to me because it does go back to childhood of going with my mum and dad. And, you know, it's just the, the, the memories and the joy that that brought me when I was growing up. And then I think just looking it into people's faces and, and you know, I'm working in a school, just well, I was working in a school over lockdown in, in, in Greenock where the kids come to the panto every year and the kids in the school, you, most of them have learning difficulties and they absolutely live to go and see that panto. They were devastated when it wasn't on and they adore Lee who plays Buttons and they, they tell me so much about every single panto they've ever been to see and I think there's nothing really as special as that for anybody. I think the fact that grannies come with their grandchildren and you, you get to look along the road and see your wee granny singing along and smiling and the granny gets to see the kids enjoying it and everybody, you, you become a kid again. I remember when my boys got to about 13, 14, they didn't really want to come to the panto for about a year or something. It wasn't cool. And then that flips again. And now they absolutely love it. And it's like an excuse to be a kid and to shout out and have fun. And I just think there's there's nothing else like that. I can't think of one other thing where everybody would come together like that. No, you're absolutely right. It is totally inclusive, isn't it? This year, fingers crossed, panto will be back. Who knows what sort of form it will be, you know, because we don't know where we'll be with the pandemic hopefully we'll be able to return and do panto as everybody remembers it but i bet you can't wait oh absolutely and i think it is a very very safe place you know they, they will be very careful and it would be just so sad if we didn't get to do a pantomime this year i, I really i'm really hoping and praying that things keep going in the direction that they are and everything gets to to open up. I must tell this story quickly before I go because it's a delicious story. And my boys had gone to see uh, the King's Panto. So I wasn't there obviously because I'm doing Panto down in Greenock. And this was a few years ago and my younger boy, who so he would maybe be at about 12 or 13 at the time. And he said, Mum, Mum, you'll never guess. You'll never guess who I was sitting next to. So it was a kind of press opening night. And I was like, who darling? And he went, it's Cheryl Cole. Oh, I said, were you? I said, Cheryl Cole was at the Kings? And he went, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, maybe she was because she could have been up doing something in Glasgow and somebody said, it's press night. Do you want to come and see the show? It's a fabulous show, you know. So I was like, oh, really? And, and were you talking to her? He said, yes, I was. And I said, oh, that was good. And, and so we had this huge, big conversation. And then my older boy came in. I said, I hear that you were sitting next to Cheryl Cole at the Panto. And he went, no, mum, it wasn't Cheryl Cole. It was Susan Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> so I could just imagine, like, the pop career at Susan Boyle <laughs> and with Cheryl Cole just swap the two of them about. Like, that would have been a completely different dynamic. But there you are. I thought, oh, joy. Listen, what a lovely story to finish with. Wish you all the best for Panto and in the, the season at Pitlockery as well. I hope the weather's kind to you if it's outdoors. Oh, it's been fabulous. Honestly, it's every day. I think we'd rain for the first half of one show. That's all we've had. 
So, yep, it's been really great. Well, fingers crossed it stays that way. Jane, thank you so much for talking to us. Not at all. Absolute pleasure, Martin. Hope we get to work together one day. Oh, Jane, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Listen, we'll keep our fingers crossed and thanks again. And that's about it from this episode. Don't forget you can subscribe through your favourite podcast app. Make sure you do that now and you won't miss any future episodes. And make sure you join me, Martin Ballard, next time when I'll be talking to Director, Associate Professor of Acting at Staffordshire University and Artistic director of the Mitchell Arts Centre in Stoke-on-Trent, Robert Marsden. That's next time on episode 13. Thank you for listening to the latest edition of Just Imagine, the podcast series from Imagine Theatre. And you can find out more by going to www.imagintheatre.co.uk.